Thank you. Come on in our kitchen. That's our favorite song these days, and we want to say it to you right now. I'm Alice Randall. And I'm Caroline Randall Williams. And this is Soul Food Love. Um, what we want to do is we're going to do a teeny bit of reading, it's a very small amount of reading. Then we're going to ask each other three questions, and then we're going to open up the floor and let you guys ask us some questions. So, Caroline, would you like to kick it off after I make this um, statement that this book is very personal. It's a series of love letters um, from Caroline and I to the generation before us. It's a series of love letters to the generation ahead of us. And it's also, the recipes are really love letters that Caroline wrote to me. And so when we invite you in this book, we are inviting you into our family love story. And it's finally really a love letter to America. And I think we'll let Caroline kick off with a little reading that. From the preface, yes. A Tale of Five Kitchens. This cookbook tells the story of five kitchens. Three generations of women who came to weighing more than 200 pounds, and a fourth generation that absolutely refused ever to weigh 200 pounds. <laughs> it's the story of a hundred years of cooking and eating in one black American family. On these pages, we share the kitchen memories, kitchen gossip, and food ways that sustained two great grandmothers, a grandmother, and us, a mother and daughter. Dear's kitchen, grandma's kitchen, nana's kitchen, mama's kitchen, Alice's, and baby girl's kitchen, mine. All are sacred places in our family, but only one is simple, baby girls. The recipes in this book are from Baby Girl's Kitchen. You can cook every one from a Walmart shelf, or you can cook them from your home garden or Whole Foods. But wherever you get your foodstuffs, cook these recipes and you will be tasting the past swerving into a new and healthier future. You will be tasting us using what we got to get where we want to go to fit land without forgetting, shaming, or blaming traditional soul foods or traditional soul food ways. Our kitchen celebrates forgotten soul food staples. We love sweet potatoes, peanuts, and sardines. Our ancestresses loved them too. For us, the path to our black food future runs through our black food past, and it requires radical change. Change that starts in the kitchen on the quick and on the cheap. We know because we did it in our family. Fought back hard against fat while holding proud to our table. Others are doing it too, becoming kitchen sink Amazons, winning the war on fat, one tasty, home-fixed and healthy meal at a time. These recipes are the work of a daughter who searched out the healthier bites and bits from her mother's oop. <laughs> Are the healthier bites and bits from her family's cooking history and remix the best of the rest into something greener, into something healthier and easier, working beside a mother determined to change her own food ways so she might change her daughter's food future. This is the story of our search for a kitchen where what's good is good for you. And nothing is finer than a good taste on a healthy tongue. And we want to give you a little taste now of... Um Deer's Kitchen. Since we're here with family, extended family, this is a picture of Deer, um, son and papa, near their wedding in 1913. Uh, Deer was born in 1897 in Selma, Alabama, and she died in 1976 in Detroit, Michigan. Um, her real name was Minnie. Minnie rarely cooked. She appeared to cook daily. Her husband, Will Randall, who'd grown up in Selma, Alabama, around white women who'd never lifted a hand in their own kitchens, couldn't stand to see his Negro wife peel a potato or quarter a hen. So Will did all the peeling and chopping, the snapping of beans and the cleaning of greens, the mixing and stirring. Deer finished the food and served it, first in Selma, then in Detroit. Papa and Deer's Selma table was near the Johnson family farm, which was Deer's family farm. If Deer recalled the Johnson family farm in Alabama as an eye in the middle of the storm that was Jim Crow, it was 
an island she understood to be precarious and vulnerable. She understood what her husband Will understood, that every acre of the black southern farm was fertilized with the memory of slavery, watered with the shaming of Jim Crow, seeded with the descendants of kitchen rapes during and after slavery, and tilled with the ever-present threat of lynching. In the land of strange fruit, farm-to-table food, urban chicken coops, even cool, juicy watermelon, have complex resonances often overlooked, ignored, or misread. Deer didn't overlook, ignore, or misread the complexities. She fell in love with every process that distanced food from the farm and every habit that freed her from the kitchen her black grandmother had been shackled to in her white father's home. And so it was that Will kept cooking and Deer kept growing flowers, even as the family began to eat out more, become intrigued with TV dinners and tang, with smorgasbords and bars, with all the fancy eats money could buy or market could imagine. Fascinated by everything that promised modernity and with it equal opportunity and safety that came with distance from Alabama, southern rural kitchens and rural acres. Papa and Deer associated soil food with the life they had left behind in the South. Processed food equaled progress. I didn't learn to cook a single dish in my grandmother's kitchen. I, in light of that, am going to read you a recipe for a cocktail from Deer's kitchen. Deer's sweet forgiveness. It's also a pretty extraordinary family anecdote. In her early marriage days, when Deer wanted to make a cocktail, she would take whatever cordial she had on hand, perhaps dewberry, and dilute it with soda water. She liked her drinks sweet, weak, seldom, and delicious. Deer and Papa had a grand love. Because he could not read or write, every day she would read his mail to him. One day a letter came that read, I know you love wife, but we had son, and I can't take care of him anymore. Papa walked off ashamed. Dear didn't say a word. Instead, she sent for that boy and raised him in Detroit with her own. I do not keep dewberry cordial in my house, but there's usually a bottle of Saint-Germain, the haunting floral liqueur. People seem to love to give me the statuesque, faceted, blue-labeled bottles that look like perfume and drink like a garden. I definitely do not mind. We think this drink is almost as sweet as Deer's forgiveness. And before I introduce you, that's Caroline's first grand grandmother in the book, I'm gonna introduce you to her second. I will say that um, Papa, that man who was Deer's great kick kitchen man and also a sort of self-made millionaire in Detroit, he was the son of Confederate General Edmund Pettus, which makes the story more interesting. If you read our cookbook, you'll find out more about that. Um, I now want to introduce you to Caroline's, uh, the great-grandmother that she knew so well, Alberta Johnson, who was born in 1906 and, gradu um, and died, graduated to heaven in 2004. <laughs> Grandma's favorite foods were bridge party foods, links foods, companies coming food, complex chicken salads, elaborate aspects, checker, checkerboard sandwiches, rum balls, tall layer cakes, home frozen custards, roasted turkeys, shrimp creole, salmon moles. These were the dishes that established her reputation as a hostess beyond the family circle, and these were the dishes she cherished and perfected, the building blocks of her many memorable feast for other club women. In Nashville, as in so many segregated cities in the South between the Civil War and the Vietnam, if you were black and wanted to enjoy fancy food outside your home, you had to join a club, Grandma Bonton Blanc about six or seven, which meant you had to turn your home into a banquet hall when it was your turn to host. Your turn to host in the Black South, this simple declaration has been known to bring strong women to tears, church women to curses, good marriages to the brink of divorce, and drag the financially secure out of the black ink and into the red. These women understood they were being asked to create an occasional meal so dignified it was a cure for a myriad of race, daily race-based indignities, so original it defied and exploded stereotypes, so cosmopolitan, it claimed a planet as theirs. They were being asked to present a meal that was no less than an act of civil realignment. 
Women who never hit their children, never cursed their husbands, never dropped a friend, never bounced a truck, were known to commit all of these and more sins when it was their turn. <laughs> Not grandma. For grandma, her turn was her turn to shine. Grandma believed identity could be painted on the tongue with flavor. She believed that her pots and her spoons could be equal to the paper and pen or canvas and pigment. She understood the club meeting meal to be an art form and the great club meeting hostesses to be artists. And she understood her art to be political. If some folks thought she was just an amazing housewife, she did not set them straight. And now we're going to read a recipe in honor of Grandma Vonton. And don't worry about that baby. There should be a baby in every kitchen, <laughs> and we welcome be, it. always. No, we're this baby to... was in my kitchen from the very beginning. Hold on. Well, Escarline finds her space. Oh, uh, I found it. Don't yeah, worry. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I was going to tell you she started cooking at about 18 months old. <laughs> so this is a salmon mousse in honor of Alberta Bonton. This is the kind of dish grandma loved. It is a perfect fancy party food that can be made on the cheap and in advance. If Nana was making it, if Nana, being her daughter, was making it, she would have added Louisiana brand hot sauce, taken out the dill, thrown in a bit of cayenne to turn this elegant mousse into something suitable for a bar. And she might have served it on cucumber slices. On this occasion, I prefer grandma's way. Um, we are now going to introduce you to Nana, Joan Marie Bonton Williams, Caroline's grandmother. Joan was born in Harlem in 1927 in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance. Her father was one of the leaders of it. His best friend was Langston Hughes, and she died here in Nashville in 1998. And she was Caroline's beloved Nana. By 1968, the year Avon Williams was elected as the first black state senator in Tennessee since Reconstruction, Everyone in historically black North Nashville knew the revolution had a chief cook and bottle washer, and her name was Joan. They also knew the civil rights movement in Nashville had a kitchen, and that kitchen had an address, 1818 Marina Street, the home of Joan and Avon Williams. In other cities, civil rights leaders were feted with Sunday's preacher's coming favorites. Ch fried chicken and potato salad washed down with sweet tea. In Nashville, National and local civil rights leaders got their drink on and feasted on bar food. When Alberta and Arna Bonton's oldest daughter, Joan Marie, married Avon Williams, a strikingly handsome black attorney from Knoxville, who was first cousins to Thurgood Marshall, an elegant Nashville wedding dissected and acclaimed in some circles for the next half century in 1957, most predicted Joan would soon retire from serving as university librarian and settle into being the kind of housewife mother hostess grandma had been. Persnickety, praiseworthy, praise loving, and above all presiding high in an all black bubble of formal elegance. Joan and Avon had other plans. They bid a modern house smack dab in the center of North Nashville, then flung open their doors to all and sundry. After they set up a bar with fancy glasses and top shelf liquor, Joan got her food mill out and her blender plugged in. She loved to smash and pulverize. <laughs> now, Nashville's iconic hot chicken has, is traditionally fried piece by piece, a slow and arduous process for a home cook trying to feed a crowd. Joan's hot chicken wings were simmered in butter and hot sauce. You could cook them cheap and quick and buy the vat. If she needed something cheaper and quicker, she'd serve dozens of perfectly boiled eggs tipped in salt. In Nashville at Jones, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, it was always payday Friday night. Hard liquor flowed and tasty bites were served, and nobody got charged but Mr. and Mrs. Williams. In honor of Mrs. Williams, I'm going to read you a salad that we came up with as sort of a new addition to the soul food canon. Um, Jones Niçoise with okra lady fingers. The downtown campus of Tennessee State University is now named the Avon and Williams campus in honor of Nana's husband, my grandfather. Though today the school graduates often become doctors and lawyers and nurses and teachers, TSU's origins as an agricultural institution devoted to creating scientific farmers is revealed by the acres it still has under cultivation. In fact, the campus is now part of the cutting edge phenomenon of urban black gardeners. 
and the Ag School at TSU is enjoying a renaissance in sustainability, food justice, and food security, and become front line, which have become front lines across the United States. In the summer of 2013, TSU gardens were enjoying a bumper crop of okra, and some of the gardeners were pickling it. That's what inspired this salad. Okra is an acquired taste, unless it's pickled. Cooked most ways, okra can be peculiarly or wonderfully slimy, depending on whether you have acquired a taste for it. Pickled okra is crisp and earthy with an astringent bite. While we know precious few people who put up their own cucumber pickles these days, for some reason, we do have lots of friends who like to pickle their own okra. It is thought that okra is an Igbo word and one of the few African words to remain intact in the English language. In some parts of the English-speaking world, the vegetable is referred to as ladyfingers. We named our version to honor a woman who worked her fingers to the bone in support of the movement and didn't, like her husband, get a building named after her. Joan would have preferred a dish anyhow, and this dish is honest and just plain good with pickle bite, like the lady herself. Acknowledging that most of us don't make the time to pickle our own okra, and because it's what Joan would have used, this recipe used is store-bought but home pickled is best. Oh, and then do I get to segue into a recipe? It's now my turn to take over for a minute before I give it back to my inevitable mother. Um, I'm going to read you a recipe that I think embodies the woman sitting to my right instead of reading from her memoir portion, and it's of the sweet potato broth. One January, a few years back, Mama needed a quick substitute for chicken stock. The author, Randall Keenan, was coming for dinner. On the menu was a new South classic, black-eyed pea and kale stew made with homemade chicken broth. But just before Mama began to stir up a pot of worthy tribute to a writer who had made small-town black North Carolina a place readers of all colors could wish to linger, we got a call alerting us that another dinner guest was a vegetarian. Fortunately, the ghost of George Washington Carver, perhaps inspired by Keenan's first novel, A Visitation of Spirits, entered our kitchen and started tugging on an apron. Mama called me to throw around ideas for alternative stocks. Before we knew it, we were inventing, just like Carver, and changing the stew forever. This sweet potato broth is easy, delicious, cheap, and vegetarian, and it isn't salty. Canned chicken stocks, while convenient, often have way too much salt and the flavors can be tinny, flat, or just plain off. I also love this broth because the recipe is not meant to be exact. You can't mess it up, and you don't get more southern than a sweet potato. Improvise with that, Ooh, improvise with what you have on hand, and your taste buds will tell you what ought to happen. And we're so excited that um, the sweet potato broth has been, um, the whole article in the Washington Post has just come out about it, and they're talking about how everyone's talking about bone broths right now, and they say that bone it's broths are nothing It's the anti-hipster answer. Is, <laughs> and they say that bone broths are really just chicken, are stocks. They're saying, what is this? They said the only new original idea is hers. It's the sweet potato stock. They said that is the most original new idea in stock and broth in the last... We're pretty excited about it. <laughs> so the last thing that we'll read for you is a portion from my section of the book, Baby Girl's Kitchen. My mother's kitchen was and is a magical place. Cooking for her is a special event. There's always been a grand sense of ceremony, and I think many of you know this about Alice's kitchen. There has always been a grand sense of ceremony about the times she chooses to grace the kitchen, something that I have found to be both a point of admiration and a source of frustration. My mom doesn't often lift a whisk or preheat an oven, unless it is the beginning of a masterpiece meal. Otherwise, her kitchen remains pristine, her refrigerator uncluttered, <laughs> her, <laughs> her refined palate appeased in one of the many favorite restaurants we have in and around Nashville, many of whom are owned by Max Goldberg. <laughs> in my mom's kitchen, I learned all the complicated, delicious, we really shouldn't eat this every day, but really want to eat this every day, and we'll eat it way too often and way too much of it, food that I still treasure. <laughs> I remember helping cook Thanksgiving, sitting for hours at the kitchen table, peeling tiny pearl onions that my mother would simmer with just heaps of heavy cream, salt, and pepper. 
If the food wasn't for a holiday, it was often themed. One of my dearest memories is of a phase in which she announced that we were no longer eating dinner but having high tea. She showed me how to roll the plain white sandwich bread very thin and cut off the crusts to let the butter get to room temperature so we could spread it to love the crunch and clean flavor of plain cucumbers and asparagus folded between the bread and butter. And then, of course, came the soup in beautiful bowls powdered with pink flowers, bowls I now use in Mississippi. She would pour me soups of her own creation, some she learned and experimented with when she did her independent study of English tea with Julia Child during her time at Harvard, and she would garnish them with edible flowers. Those meals are a childhood treasure to me. My future children are not going to, my future children are going to eat very differently from how I did as a kid. I ate out. My kids will eat in. I thought cooking was for special occasions. My kids will know that cooking is for every day. I thought soul food was a guilty pleasure. My kids will know soul food is a healthy truth. I'll want my kids to get underfoot in the kitchen. They will be brave and adventurous and know the flavors they like and enjoy the experiment of creating them. When I have a family, we will know that vegetables don't happen by magic and they don't just happen in grocery stores either, that they can also happen in pots on a deck and in a raised bed or in a small plot out in the yard. There was a time not long ago when black people didn't have much that they could call theirs, save for the people they loved and what little food they could try to make special to put in their mouths. So when I say I know food is important to us, I mean it is indispensable, emotional, historical, and above all, it's precious. A pot of greens washed seven times before cooking, one for each day God created the world and for the day he rested, was a way a mother could show love when she couldn't buy things. I want to keep that spirit. I want to keep those flavors, but I want to do it in a way that my children know their mama is looking out for their bodies as well as their souls. And looking out for her own body too. But I'm not a mama yet. So for now, Standing on the shoulders of these brilliant, big, black women, I go on ahead and feed my friends from my small kitchen. I feed them from my history, from our history, our past, our present, and from the fresh start of what I hope our future looks like. And that, as we like to say in my family, is how you entertain like mama and stay healthy like baby girl. So now we just, after that's our little bit of reading, um, we're going to ask each other, we have three little questions, we're going to interview each other, and then we're going to open up to questions from you all. So my first question, first of all, I want to, um, as I said, thank my co-author, because uh, to ask one question, none of you will have the nerve to ask. Caroline did so much more than way than half of this book, that uh, she is an extraordinary collaborator, and really is the reason we were able to put health and history on a plate. Carolina, my old lady's eyes, what was your favorite piece of forgotten family history we found while researching Soul Food Love? That's a super easy one, I think. Um, learning that my great-grandfather, Papa, did all of the cooking for my great-grandmother, dear, <laughs> is pretty wonderful. And I hope I get so lucky <laughs> in his bowels one day. <laughs> and he ran a business, too. <laughs> Mom, what is your favorite bit of family history that you learned researching the book, do you think? Well, the thing I did not really, I knew that Grandma Bontemps, um, you know, they were Seventh-day Adventist, and she, uh, or they started off their lives as Seventh-day Adventist, and Grandma Bontemps met um, Arna when he was a professor at the Seventh-day Adventist school, high school that she went and attended. So I knew they had a vegetarian history, but I did not know, and he had taught at Oakwood College, that why her vegetarian kitchen was so rich was because there was a black magazine called The Messenger, The Message, that um, sent vegetarian recipes all through the Deep South to black families, starting in about 1906 and continuing through the teens, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. And so that was really one of the most exciting um, finds. And we were able to use, um, in the, including the cookbook, the Oakwood Bean Loaf, which is an old black bean loaf recipe. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I knew the black, the black Muslim bean pies from Washington, D.C. 
and from Detroit. But it was exciting to find this treasure trove of uh, black vegetarian recipes in our own family that go back a century. Okay, so the second question that we decided we would ask each other is, what is your favorite forgotten soul food staple besides the sweet potato, the sardine, sardine and the peanut? My favorite one being the mama and um, is the sesame seed. Um, you may know the Binet wafers and we have those in some of our family from Louisiana and South Carolina. But when you really go back with the sesame seed, it's one that will make me cry. Once a slave trade got going, black mothers would hide sesame seeds in their hair for the, for the middle passage ride and feed their babies and feed themselves, sometimes babies born on the ship with seeds from their hair. And then when they got to America, they would plant those seeds and keep some remaining to have a taste of home. So the resilience of that, the resilience in a sesame seed, the protein, the oil, the history, the will to live. That's my favorite one. I don't even know if I want to follow that yes. answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, as my child, always has happier ones. So <laughs> I bet you there's something wonderful on your side. What is your favorite one? My favorite one is the celebration meal. I think um, we forget that baked fish is old school soul food, and so are berries as an old school soul food treat, a celebration meal. You know, that goes all the way back to slavery as well, but the happy side of it, you know, when you were working somebody's land, whoever owned you, they knew how many chickens they had. They knew how many cows they owned. You cannot steal somebody's pig, but you can go catch a fish in the middle of the night. Nobody knows how many fish are swimming in their pond or their river, the stream by their house. So you can catch a fish and bake it in quiet and collect some berries and feed your family a celebration meal. And so I love the idea of a celebration meal that is healthy and belongs to us. So that's my answer to that one. And on that fish, I'm so glad that Caroline, and she has wonderful fish recipes, because my father, um, you know, they grow up eating, most in the 50s and 60s in the urban north, Detroit, Chicago, it was very common for black families to eat baked fish on Friday, whether or not they were Catholic. And you'll find in black uh, inner city neighborhoods, in Detroit and Chicago, lots of fish markets. And so we had that history. But here locally, um, we've had a chance to do some, through the course at Vanderbilt and through Caroline's involvement with David, which how we got inspired in the Hermitage when they were doing volunteer work. There's archaeology about black fish culture. You can find in the slave quarter areas um, actual fish hooks, actual fish bones, and you can see in document tools the Hermitage. Tools made from fish bones. Tool, yes, exactly. Tools made from fish bones. So this has been undiscussed, but it's a true, that is actually a, local, a very well-established African-American food way, particularly in Middle Tennessee. Do you want to do the last one? Oh, well, the last question is, what was the hardest thing, what was the most challenging and most rewarding thing about writing a book with your hard-headed child? <laughs> I can honestly, you all know, most of you know me, you say that I am an honest woman. There was actually nothing hard for me about writing with Caroline. She pulled more than her half of the load, and she's she, she brings the fun. <laughs> I, she, I may sometimes bring the tears. She brings the laughter, and she is such I think that's the company integrity. line. No, that's a, no, she does bring the fun. She brings the fun. What was, but I, I know there are a lot of hard things about me. <laughs> so you've got all your, you've got your, your audience, your population to support you. Well, it's the hardest thing. I'm mean, genuinely the hardest thing about working with Alice Randall is keeping up with her work ethic. So I think that was, but it was also really good for me, just like healthy soul food. <laughs> um, and I one question: uh, How many cookbooks do you own, Caroline? Close to two thousand. Yes, and or actually, no more than close to four thousand now. Yeah. I just doubled my collection. I was donated by a family member a whole additional supplement to my own collection, so it's now close to four thousand. 
And that original cookbook to collection was put together by Nana, uh, Caroline's grandmother. And that was started off as a segregation collection from that time when they had to be in the um, clubs to have meals. And so she put together a cookbook collection that was you know, almost 2,000 strong and that she fed her community out of that. And it started off, so that's really exciting. Now, we promised we want to um, we want to turn this over to you all to ask us any questions, or we'll just speak informally with you about this now. So we welcome any questions from our audience or any memories you have about soul food ways or kitchen. Amanda. Hi. Well, I, I am I'm so happy to be here and to cook these recipes. I can't wait. Um, and, and I hope that I have a, a, a relationship with my daughter that's as, as profoundly um, productive uh, as yours. Um, and I'm, I'm wrestling with my son here, and it, it, it made me think about the, the role of men and the sort of shift that we're seeing in our generation of the sort of, um, of uh, cooking as the, the, and the kitchen that's the, the domain of the woman and the kitchen as the domain of the man, uh, and a shared domain. And can you talk about that, how Caroline in particular, how you see, you know, this is a book about grandmothers and, and matriarchy. What are the roles of the men in your sort of cooking line, and how do you see that shifting among your friends, the, the kitchen as a domain, as a male domain, as much as it is a female domain? Well, I love that question. Um, as we talked about a little bit with deer, you know, I have in this, in my family in particular, this one radically potent example of a man in the kitchen, i.e. Papa, who was literally cooking all of the food that was in their house and then letting his wife get away with saying that it was her food because of the trauma of watching his mother be a domestic servant in the kitchen of his father, right? And that was such a harrowing experience for him that he could not stand to see another black woman that he loved cook food and so he cooked the food himself. Um, but then, of course, on the other side, we do have these incredible home cooks in my family. Um, and I think I love what you're talking about. You know, I'm a millennial. Millennial kitchen culture, you know, chefs are guys with, you know, you know, sturdy forearms and covered in tattoos and staying up until all hours. So there's like a great number. There's a huge food culture that is male run in the sort of restaurant side of things. But I think that it's really becoming a collaborative event, you know, in both directions because there is that strong pull of the, you know, the chefs and then there's, you know, the millennial chef culture and then there's also the balance of the, you know, deeper women in the kitchen tradition. And I think that's sort of meeting in a happy middle right now. And I think one of the problems is right now most of the millennials of Caroline students can't cook at all. Because There's they're obsessed with female. watching food television and food pictures and so and eating out and taking pictures of it and putting it on Instagram and then their they and their fear of failure means that since they can't create what they saw in a restaurant, they just don't cook at all. Which we're trying to help fix. I know that when I cook, I know my children always say they never eat the same meal twice because I don't measure anything. It's a vibration to borrow from Verde Grover, vibration cooking. One of our favorite cooks. We love Verde May. <laughs> that one is total vibration. <laughs> Holly, I, I think my vibration started as an act of defiance against my mother, you know, in the sense that my mother is so meticulous in the kitchen because she also comes from a French and a baking background as well, you know, with the souffles where it has to be exactly this time and exactly this amount of flour. And so I was like, Mom, it'll be fine, you know? Like, <laughs> you know I never, like, she was the one that would slice the top off of the, you know, off of the measuring cup to make sure the flour is even, and I'm sort of going... You know, straight, I don't even sift. You know, so there's definitely, a, I'm, a, I'm the vibration cooker and she is the meticulous one. But that was a part of, that was probably the most exciting part of making the cookbook was this. All of these are my home cooked recipes. So I'd sort of be practicing and writing them down for publishing purposes. And I'd like toss the olive oil into the pan and be like, oh no. And like pour it back into a teaspoon <laughs> to see how much it was and then write down the number. <laughs> and I really, you know, I started learning to cook you know, in Detroit, as a little child, I was at Weird Child who, um, the Julia Child show had just started, and I was born in 1959. So about 1965, I started watching 
uh, Julia Child on TV and The Galloping Gourmet. These were my two of my favorite shows in the 60s. And then as I got older and learned to read, I cooked my way all the way through Mastering the Art of French Cooking and um, did a lot of Joy of Cooking and the Craig Claiborne. So I really taught myself to cook as a middle school, high school girl. Uh, my mother, so I have that more formal background and approach and ended up working with Julia Child one-on-one -on -one, you know, for some, so it's, but that's also why I probably don't cook that much. And um, I, you know, true confession, it's in the book. I said, Carol, at home we had a series of hippie cooks, white hippie cooks who cook for us. <laughs> and here, you know, when I, when Caroline was growing up, because we're working, and then we get to eat in these fabulous restaurants. So I think that um, uh, learning to improvise, but like jazz music, you have to really know the rules. And Caroline says that she doesn't measure things, but uh, she is. A I very apprenticed her, balance. so I don't need to. But it's a yeah, no, definitely. Any other questions? Oh yeah, of course. Yes, what would you like to do? Well, it's interesting, it had um, the um, Black Seventh Day Adventists, you know, Black uh, Seventh Day Adventists don't eat flesh food. Um, and it's actually a denomination that is very, uh, has a high preponderance of African Americans in it. But what was really interesting particularly is the, um, that they were very involved in Mississippi, Alabama, and the Deep South. Um, we have uh, at the top of the head note of this, um, it talks about, um, well, actually, we had to actually cut that out. But um, Huntsville, Alabama, the details <laughs> about the message, I was trying to look at the name of that magazine, because it actually predates 1907. It actually, in a, with a different name, goes back to the immediate days of Reconstruction. And so it had weekly and monthly, at different times, it went a different number of times. It's going through the mail. It was all through Mississippi and Alabama, I mean, it went all through the South. Um, but it was coming regularly with these recipes. All their recipes were vegetarian. Um, and Grandpa actually published in it in terms of uh, fiction and things of this sort. So she was very, very involved with this magazine. But what's interesting, it's one of the first magazines that was all geared towards black Southerners. So it had reached way outside of the Seventh-day Adventist community. And it's really um, quite extraordinary. It's hard to get a hold of, but we actually have some, there's some digitized files on that. And um, you know, that's, I think, a great project. I'm trying to get a, you know, I'm hoping to get a graduate student or someone really involved in collecting those recipes and putting them together. And you have to sort of assume that part of the popularity, too, you know, in terms of it being so popular, is that being a vegetarian is cheaper. Right, so you have, to, and you know, if you're a poor black person and you can f feed your family on beans instead of on chicken, that's some, that's a precious, that's a precious um, tool for you. So that's a, that's a significant reason, I imagine, why the, why the, it was so popular. And one other thing, before I take um, the question right behind you, is um, this isn't the only important black vegetarian and health food movement. People think of, you know, African Americans really looked at health food earlier. Um, Dick Gregory, the comedian, had, uh, has published early. He's the one who actually coined the phrase soil food instead of soul food. Um, but that goes back to the 60s, not just the things that he did later. And then Elijah Muhammad, the most things, I'm not a big Elijah Muhammad fan, but one of the things that Elijah Muhammad was very active and aggressive about, I mean, the founder of, you know, the leader of the black Muslim, uh, group was that black people were being killed in their kitchens. Uh, he was opposed to fried chicken. He was opposed to fried foods. He actually pushed forward uh, vegetarian foods uh, and you know not eating of pork. So Elijah Muhammad was one of the. So there have been many early uh, black vegetarian movements, but the most significant that goes back to the 19th century is the uh, one, the Seventh Day at Venice. Yes. Any recipes that 
by working together on it, you came up with something that's strictly Alice and Caroline. Well, I'll take that one first. Um, one, I, we had the, pl the privilege, pleasure, practice of writing a book together, you know, B.B. Bright before this. That was great. But I think, um, you know, as a young creative person or really a young professional person of any kind, the dream is to get to work at the hand, learn at the hand of somebody who's an expert in your field, right? And my mother is, you know, by any standard, an expert in the field of writing. And not only that, but she has purely my best interest at heart and is relentless in her pursuit of my own, you know, my own gains in life. So getting to learn at her hand, getting to work with her was just totally extraordinary, one. Um, two, I think my favorite recipe that I think of as collaborative of the two of us is Funnily, the um, chicken and wild rice soup, which I cooked for her um, now two summers ago when I was cooking through all the recipes sort of over and over again for measurement purposes, vibration <laughs> cooking. Um, and she said, this is new. And I said, no, it's not. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you made this for me um, when you were doing that tea phase <laughs> when, I was, when I was eight or nine. You made me chicken and rice soup with vegetables and she was like well that's not exactly my soup but I said you know but it that it, I made it from my memories of her cooking for me as a little girl and she had forgotten them because she's you know prepared countless meals for me actually even though she did take me out a lot and it was so fun for me to revive something that she'd actually given to me years ago and forgotten that she'd given to and me. And we liked it. It's a wild rice soup, so um, it's one of, which is one of the Native American influences. One of the other big influences in the African American food ways that isn't examined enough um, are the smoked, uh, the barbecue traditions and the influence of Native American foods. And the wild rice soup was something that I had cooked a different version of it for Caroline, trying to tell her about um, our Native American influences and <laughs> antecedents way, way, way back. I think for me, the biggest discovery was that it was, and I will say something very personal, that it's, there was a time to let go, to realize, because when we did B.B. Bright, Caroline had huge impact on it, and it, she was in it, but she had started as a child, so some of it was her taste driving it, some of it was her creativity and writing. We finished it when she was in graduate school, so she had become a writer, written a thesis. But this book, The True Thing, that I her fingerprints are not only on it, she, as I said, she's at least 60%, 70%. So I learned that I was over the hill. <laughs> and it's been an actual thrill. I learned that I could, you know, that she's not only a better driver than I, and I can get driven around by her, but in a literary sense, I can get driven around, and then she will let me come out and read some of the essays that she wrote and claim them as my own. I get to drive in her car. So, <laughs> that's like really, my great-grandfather before me. Yeah, I get to ride in her car. So that, uh, that's what I, I actually learned to have, that I could let go, and that she actually, she may say that I was an expert, but you know, Caroline has another book coming out, a book of poetry in April, and we all know I am the hard mother who once told her about some paper that I couldn't say anything about it. We should just tear it in half that it needed too much improvement. And she said, well, if I turned it in, it would be an A. And I said, well, maybe a Nashville A, not a national A. <laughs> and and I, that's not putting anything down about Nashville. I'm just saying that you're not, don't focus on your local uh, competition. Think of your national competition. So when I honestly say she is a better writer than I am, and I am proud of how, what a good writer I am, she is a better writer than I am now. Um, she had the advantage, I, I feel it's a little like Venus and Serena. She had the advantage, Serena had the advantage of playing with Venus. So she had the advantage, but she is a better, Serena is a better tennis player than Venus, and Caroline is a better ten, uh, writer than I am. Any more questions? I, I was noticing the other delicious thing about this book is the language. I mean, you just talked about writing a little bit, but I was wondering if, other than from each other, if you learned anything about language from your ancestors, from these wonderful women, along with the food. Oh, I love that question. Um, well, my grandma's husband was um, a Harlem Renaissance poet, so I grew up reading a great deal of poetry and fiction from you know the from that movement, um, and I think that. We hope that that sort of verbal jazz 
that is so characteristic of the Harlem Renaissance poetry and fiction would permeate some of our work. And also, we love country music, so we love the lyric as well. What else? What do you think, Mom? Um, we can make that almost our last question. I think that Deer actually had the be biggest impact. Because when you read this, you'll tell you, Deer didn't cook. What she did at her dining and she didn't cook. What she did at her dining room table is she would sit me down in a formal dining room on a beautiful crocheted or damask table, and she would literally feed me a book. Because she could barely, she'd never been to school. Her husband could not read or write. They was a self-made millionaire. She thought reading and literacy was the most important thing. So she would sit us down at the table and serve you books and serve you some food to go along with it. God, I mean, it's someone else had done. But reading and then the power of language, the power, when she eventually told me that story about reading that letter, that that other woman had, um, you know, made an effort for her son through language and she responded in language and written language, words on paper. That story of how that woman saved her, her son's life with words on paper and how Deer showed mercy with words on paper writing back to her. I will never write any words as powerful as that. But Carol, we hopefully maybe with this book and that will be our last. Now this book, you can cook everything in here on Snap with food stamps. You can buy every ingredient here from Walmart. It's not that we are supporting Walmart, it's that we deal with the real. And the struggle is real, and the transcendence is real too. And there are poor people who the best grocery store they will ever get to is Walmart, and we're not above Walmart. And there are, so we really want with this book, there's a lot of poetry in it, but we actually hope there's some bomb in Gilead <laughs> that people could actually take this book and save their lives, you know, that, you know, lose the 20%, 10% of their body weight associated with a 50% reduction in diabetes, or the 20% associated with 100%, or just the 5% associated with a complete um, breaking away from the fat-fueled cancer risk. Literally, three months of eating out of this book could save someone from getting cancer. And that is what we really wanted, that is what, we hope to make it pretty and sweet, but ultimately, you know, our work is really political and poetic. We're like following Grandma Bonton's steps. She was giving those little dinner parties, but she was putting a lot of politics in it. hip hop in that way, too. Yeah. So thank you for coming. We know you're really busy. Thank you. <laughs>